welcome everyone to this webinar and we'll do our introductions so I can still see people arriving. Uh, but my name is Phil Clothier and I have my colleague Tor Anaroth with me. I think many of us uh, have met us and we are extremely uh, happy to invite uh, Annalise and Charles and Jim to be our guests today. All of these webinars are special but this one is special for me and uh, I, I, one personal very quick story uh, my relationship started with Jim uh, oh maybe more than 10 years ago when Jim was still at Yale New Haven and Jim had such a vision such commitment such passion to do this work and and this story I guess roots from there but that's enough for, for, for my introduction Tor uh, yeah, and I'll uh, well, build on that. Jim uh, is actually the reason why we all sit here uh, to share this story. I mean, you are the one who invited Annalise and, and Charles to be to come to your organization. Uh, for those who don't know uh, Jim, Jim is the senior vice president and the chief financial officer at the USC, United, uh, the uh, University of Southern California. And um, it's that in that role that you have been inviting to to a whole system change journey. And, and Annalise and, and Charles is going to share the learnings from the field, so to speak, what happened uh, or has happened. And it's still going on as far as I understand. Is that correct, Jim? Yes, it is. And, and um, I am also, uh, to me, this is a very special moment. Uh, both Charles and Annalise are very special to me and, and I have really high regards for their knowledge and, and, and experiences in the field. So I'm really looking forward to this uh, webinar as well. Now, um, we need to say as well that this is recorded uh, and it will be possible for you to listen to this afterwards. The slides uh, will be shared in PDF format as well. We welcome you to write in your questions as uh, the presentation continues and the presentation will be for our about 40 minutes something like that 40 45 minutes and then we have some time at the end to answer questions and all questions will be answered it's not at it's not doing done during this hour it will be in in written format afterwards uh, sent out to everyone who has registered uh, uh, sure. and it, yeah I, I just want to say that uh, I met uh, Charles and Annalise in 2016 in Toronto at a Barrett values conference and when I met them, I knew I wanted them to work at uh, USC. Uh, so I am really thrilled to be here uh, for the, the, this amazing part of the journey and look forward to the Q&As. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Thank you. So one quick reminder, because we're going to kick off very soon. Um, one is there's a chat box, and we would invite people to connect with each other, and we can chat in the chat box. But if you have any questions that you want to pose to Annalise, Charles, and Jim at the end, then please use the Q&A area because that's where we'll be curating the Q&A. Um, if we see any other questions in the chat box, they might get picked up afterwards, but, but we'll be using the Q&A area as the main area where we're, we're picking those up from. So I think with that said, Tor, anything else for you? Well, I just saw that uh, Riccardo Ber uh, Ber Berretto uh, from it uh, Italy is actually checking in as well, and he wanted us to know that. So Richard Barrett is here as well. <laughs> Hi, Richard. <laughs> nice to see you. <laughs> no, I think that's all uh, for now. Uh, we, we need to leave as much uh, as... We will disappear now uh, and come back uh, at the Q&A at the end. So uh, please, Annalise and Charles, uh, the floor is yours. Hmm. Thank you so much, uh, Tor, Phil, uh, Jim. Thank you for getting out of bed at five in the morning, Jim, to be here and to join us uh, for this. What we hope will be a bit of a, well, it is going to be a conversation, a conversation uh, between Annalise and I as we explore our reflections on learnings from the field of, of the work. Uh, likewise, thank you. Thank you for inviting us. And uh, Annalise, thank you for being the most extraordinary partner on uh, on this journey. We thought it would be fun to maybe start with a bit of a backstory um, and how this came to pass. Jim already mentioned that uh, part of the story occurred in Toronto. We'll say more about that later. But Annalise, why don't you uh, kick us off with, uh, with a bit of our story? <laughs> thank you and uh, wonderful to be here. And thank you everyone for joining us. 
Uh, our story uh, goes back to 2009, actually, Charles, and in a conversation with Richard Barrett, I mentioned that after 27 years in corporate banking, I had followed my dream to work in remote Aboriginal communities. And I'd always had this really deep curiosity about community ownership and self-determination. And so I wanted to link up with people who were in the field and had that same thinking. So Richard said to me, you should meet Charles Holmes <laughs> and you guys are gonna get along really well. And so I said, okay, well, who is he and where is he? And, uh, and he said, well, he's in Cincinnati next week facilitating a conference on exactly this topic. So I'm in Melbourne and Cincinnati is about a 30 plus hour um, effort for me to get there. And I had exactly three days in between other engagements. So I really thought about how crazy this was, but I decided in good faith and absolute trust in Richard uh, that I would fly to Cincinnati. And as I arrive, I, I arrived just as the conference was starting and I look for this guy called Charles. <laughs> and I'm looking pretty ragged and pretty jet lagged. And I managed to slur the words. <laughs> Hi, I'm Annalise, Richard sent me, and I'm here for three days. And Charles, I remember that you looked at me and you said <laughs> three words. <laughs> you, and you said, crazy, crazy woman. girl. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that was the uh yeah that was truly was the beginning and i did think you were crazy and i still think you're crazy <laughs> and i love you for it uh it was interesting um after those three days uh annalise and i sat and we said um you know let's let's set the intention and you're going to hear us speak uh a fair bit about the power of intention uh and certainly intuition and and trust uh as as three three words that have guided so much of our work together on this journey over the last, uh, last three and a half years. So I'm going to share my screen. And, and I'm going to put my glasses on. <laughs> so We're on. We're on. So um, we're gonna share with you some of our lessons uh, from the field in this journey. Uh, we're gonna weave together some of, some of our lessons from a range of different contexts, but with the primary uh, focus being uh, the gift of opportunity that we've had to work with this extraordinary uh, division of an extraordinary educational institution, uh, namely uh, the University of Southern California, and specifically, uh, the work that we've done with the finance division uh, and uh, as you if you were here at the beginning of this uh, of this webinar met Jim Staten who uh, who invited us in to do the work with with his with his division with the finance division I think you know this is this is a bit of an outline of what we're going to cover I guess our shared hope more than anything else is that you're going to walk away from this with some some insights some tips some suggestions some ideas maybe a question or two uh, that will help you in your work uh, in, uh, in bringing about the kinds of transformative change that many of us know the Barrett Values work is, is so instrumental and helpful in doing. So we'll walk through these, these elements of, of what you see on the screen right now. But what we'd like to start with is just a couple things, a way of thinking, a way of framing uh, talk a little bit about the power of language and how language influences uh, the way we think about about change and and a few stories. Many of you who have done the the Barrett training will recognize this this model, a uh, model of whole systems thinking uh, and awareness. Sometimes refer to it as the the holographic model. There hasn't been a workshop or a session that Annalise and I have led since meeting and we'll conclude the story a little bit later about what happened after Cincinnati. That was, that was 2009, wasn't it Annalise? Yeah. But we, when we, when we've been running workshops together, I don't think there's a, a session we run where we don't put this on a flip chart or more recently in, uh, in the COVID world. And we continue to do this work uh, together. We start with this, uh, this or a version of this model of, of a reminder that we exist in a broader system 
um, and that it's important to take that into consideration. But every time we do it, we bring it back to that red uh, dot in the middle and a recognition and a reminder that all change starts with ourselves and an awareness of, of where we are coming from. We've, we've often used this, uh, this quote from Bill O'Brien who has, uh, has passed away but, but has left this, this quote as such a powerful reminder that the success of any intervention in a system depends on the internal condition of the intervenor. And I know for myself, I've often changed intervener to father, husband, colleague, partner, um, and the success as, as, a, as a father uh, so often depends on my internal condition. How am I showing up? Certainly as a consultant, uh, how am I showing up in, in doing this work? And I know that when, when I show up from a place of concern, a place of fear, a place of scarcity, uh, it's a very different impact. And it's one of the things I'm so grateful to have the opportunity to, to work with Annalise is every time we're together, we do begin with a conversation around where are we right now and how can we best support each other. Another way to think about this is we might say that the success of our actions as, as change agents, as consultants, doesn't really depend on what we do or how we do it, but on the inner place from which we operate. Uh, so, so important. And certainly the language that we use, the way we frame things, uh, has an influence on that, uh, on that place, that inner place of how we're showing up. Even the language of whole, whole systems change um, you know, is, is interesting. We see, see a lot of people talking about systems change, systems thinking. I had the pleasure of working with an indigenous elder over the last six weeks, Melanie Goodchild from the Anishwabi Nation in Ontario. She's doing her PhD right now in decolonizing systems change. And she made this interesting comment. She said, I don't talk about systems change or shifting systems. I talk about uplifting the whole. And it just so aligned, and you'll see this in the principles that guide the work that Annalise and I do. Um, and it just really hit me, uh, the power of asking the question, what is it that we're doing that's uplifting the whole? What are the systems, what are the processes that support it? And what are those that get in the way of it? So one of the great thinkers that I've met on the topic of uplifting the whole are elders Des and Estelle from a very remote community in, in Queensland, Australia. And Des points out beautifully that this new way of thinking and seeing our place in the world is actually not really new at all. And rather it speaks to the spiritual traditions of native indigenous cultures all over the world. He says that the survival of our humanity depends on our ability to understand the basic principles of cause and effect and our capacity to work together and to be interdependent. And I'm reminded of my very first time in community when that first photo was snapped also in 2009. That was a really special year where Des drew a picture of two trees representing two independent structures. And then he drew the network of the roots below the surface representing that we are all connected. And I remember when he drew it and he turned around and he looked at me and he said, Annalise, if I hurt, you know, there's always a moment that something gets you and there it is. And he said, when I hurt, you hurt. And that really stayed with me. And he referred to the image of the trees as going back to the good old days. And I acknowledge Des and Estelle today. Mm. Thank you so much, Annalise. As Annalise and I, you know, continued on this journey together, one of the things that uh, was so compelling and, and exciting to me is the learning with and from each other about both the philosophy and the, and the principles behind the work that we'd been doing independently. And it was by coming together that we began to articulate some of the principles that guide uh, so much of our work. And we're going to say more about these four uh, shortly, but uh, just keep these, hold these in your mind. We are going to ask you to, to reflect on the, the resonance of these uh, shortly. But the principles that have emerged in our conversations and our work together are belonging, connectedness. I've already mentioned uplifting the whole, 
and shifting from problem to possibility. Thank you, Charles. Um, if you'd like to go to the next, oh, actually, actually stay on that slide if you can, please, Charles. I'd like to just share a little bit of background on the significance of that particular photo. When I headed out into remote Aboriginal communities, I thought I'd only be there for a few days, but ended up staying for several years. And uh, towards the end of my stay, I was taken to traditional land called Bochat. And that's where this particular image was taken. So if you could go to the next uh, slide, Charles. Uh, thank you. And uh, I acknowledge the Thanakwith Nation whose land that photo was taken on and in deepest gratitude uh, to my tribal mother, Mary Ann Coconut. If you could go to the next slide, Charles. Thank you. And uh, Mary Ann took me under her wing during those six years and blessed me under that, um, that paperback tree and adopted me into her tribal family and gave me the Aboriginal name of Keely. And so today I also acknowledge Mary Ann Coconut. You know, when, when Annalise and I first met, um, she told me the story of, well, she told me about her intention to go and spend time on the, on the land, not knowing that it would actually be six years. Um, and when we came together, uh, about, almost exactly six years later, uh, one of the things we, uh, back to the, the, the theme of intuition, intention, and trust, uh, started to share uh, some of the language that gave rise to these principles uh, that have guided our work together. And we just want to, to acknowledge um, some of our mentors who have helped shape and, and give form to the language that we intuitively uh, sensed was at the heart of our work. Uh, for me, um, it was with Peter Block uh, in Cincinnati that I was co-delivering the workshop. I just want to read a very brief quote from Peter um, that speaks to the four principles that we're going to share more about. The essential challenge is to transform the isolation and self-interest within our communities into connectedness and caring for the whole. Peter's work has certainly informed uh, the language that Annalise and I use. I had the pleasure of spending some time with His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Uh, his language of compassion and connection uh, has been so instrumental in uh, informing my work and, and hence our work. Thank you, Charles. And it was a little bit more on Mary Ann. It was through spending time with Mary Ann and elders out on country that I was really able to ground my wisdom in those four principles. And it actually gave us a common language and it gave us a platform for all of us to move forward and create a more sustainable community. But there were many moments where I felt overwhelmed by the social, the economic impacts that exist in Aboriginal communities. And I remember Mary Ann saying to me, Annalise, life is like a rose. And along the stem of the rose, there are many, many thorns. But you must never, ever take your eye off the rose at the end of the stem. And with that, what I heard was never, ever take your eye off your own sense of purpose. And I never ever forgot <laughs> the metaphor of the rose. And of Richard, of Richard. Richard has been instrumental in my life from the first time I met him in 2000 at ANZ Bank. Uh, I heard about his work and I literally elbowed my way <laughs> to the front of the room to be able to sit there and listen to him speak. And I was hooked and uh, and from that moment forward have been using his methodologies and model in, in all of our work. But here's something that Richard doesn't know and I'd like to share here today. When I came back from my work in communities after six years of being away from home, I was diagnosed with acute depression. And I called Richard and whilst I didn't tell him about the acute depression, I did say to him, Richard, I'm feeling a bit lost. And he said, okay, do this, Thing. This is what I want you to do. He said, uh, he said, I want you to create a five minute video and I want you to call it my passion and purpose. 
and then come to Sweden and present to the BBC community on your Indigenous work. Well, I've never recorded a video ever and I had never stood on the world stage. So both of those things totally freaked me out and did absolutely nothing to quell my anxiety. But again, my trust in Richard, I, uh, I decided to go forward and I laboured over the script of that video for over a month, repeating every word until it became me. I took it to a videographer, I think that's a real word, and he patiently worked with me for two days to narrate it. And that video, that constant repetition of my passion and my purpose and then sharing my story in Sweden shifted me from depression to purpose. That was... Uh, you know, this whole presentation is going to be like this. So <laughs> absolutely <laughs> emotionally charged. And that's why this work is so real for us. And so that was a crossroad for me, Richard. And I thank you here today. And I acknowledge you here today uh, in front of our friends and our, our peers and colleagues. You know, Annalise, uh, thank you for sharing that. I didn't know that you were going to. And I just want to say that watching that, that video of you that I know you worked on so many times is, is such a powerful, such a powerful testament to your commitment to following your purpose. Uh, thank you. Beautiful. We want to um, kind of dive in a little bit to these, uh, these principles and how we use them in our uh, in our work and uh, so we're going to say a little bit about each of them uh, how we bring them into the conversations and the work that we do in uh, in transforming uh, cultures and organizations um, and after we go through the four we're just going to pause for about a minute and and ask those of you who are here live in the uh, in the webinar and if you're watching it to uh, to reflect on the resonance and, and what these mean in every engagement uh, we're looking to create opportunities for exactly what Annalise just described, connectedness, connectedness to ourselves, our own sense of, of purpose, which you know, at the heart of that is our, our core values. What are the values that guide us? Uh, so connecting to those and connecting with each other. Um, we're, we're always looking for ways and creating approaches oftentimes based on, on questions, on guiding questions uh, that connect people with each other. One of the most powerful questions, and I learned this, uh, uh, this exercise from Annalise uh, that connects people is to invite them into sharing a story with each other in pairs about a time that they felt most alive uh, in their work. And that, that exercise, and we could say a lot more about it, but we'll leave it at that for now. That simple exercise of sharing a story of a time that you felt alive so deeply connects people. Actually, I remember Richard doing that in the foyer of a hotel in Melbourne. I hadn't seen him for years and he just said, larger than life. And he yelled it out across the foyer, what's alive in you today? <laughs> it was like, whoa. <laughs> so this space of belonging is, it's just common sense to me. If you're not part of the belonging or ownership or the co-creation of something, uh, if you haven't been engaged, what's the likelihood that you're actually going to take accountability? And so if, if, if it happens in that way, it feels more like an imposition. So how that translates in the work that Charles and I do, we build internal champion networks who take the work, they own it, they model it, and they take it forward. Uh, wherever we notice a lack of accountability, we can almost always trace it back to a lack of belonging or ownership. The, uh, the, the third principle um, guiding much of what we do, I've already, I've already mentioned uplifting the whole. Another way of thinking about this is thinking on behalf of the well-being of the whole. And all too often we find you know, in, in organizations uh, the kind of silo whether it's an individual function or a group function, um, focused on how do we maximize the impact or effectiveness of our unit? And sometimes forgetting about how that and what we do, what the unintended consequences might be on the rest of the organization. 
So we're constantly inviting people into the, the question, how do these actions, how, do, how does what we're exploring now contribute to supporting the well-being of the whole? On a personal level, a question that's, uh, that's very uh, provoking and powerful is, is to ask the question, what is my contribution to the thing that I complain the most about? This recognition that I have a part, I play a part in this broader system. And the way I'm showing up, the way I'm being, can impact uplifting the whole or the well being of the whole. So, from problem to possibility, look, I have to say I'm particularly passionate about this principle. And I recall an Aboriginal elder saying to me, Annalise, we are not a problem to be solved. We are people with gifts, people with contribution. So it got me thinking about creating strategies and visionary plans from a platform of strength rather than from a position of deficiencies and needs. And so Aboriginal people will tell you that 200 plus years of penalty, prohibition and intervention is not the answer. And corporates will tell you that uh, forced compliance is not the answer either. And so I don't know about you, but I'd rather have a conversation about possibility and hope than a conversation about problems. What is it that really breathes life into our system? What are we here to create together? Uh, what, are, what, what are we here to reinvent together? So the conversation from problem to possibility is an absolutely inspiring one for me. You know, Annalise, it was certainly, as I recall back to the, the invitation, which we'll speak to a little bit more uh, from Jim Staten, it was so clear uh, that what Jim saw is an incredible possibility. And, and it's never felt like we were there to solve a problem, but we were there to co-create together the possibility of something that he and, and then others envisioned for the, for the finance division. So as I mentioned, we're gonna just just take a I'm just gonna take a moment, um, maybe maybe 30, 45 seconds. I realize that's not very long, um, but we'd really like to get a little interactivity here, if possible, uh, and invite you to just write into the chat box, you know, a few words or comments on what about what about these principles, these four principles uh, resonates for you. What strikes you about these? And Phil, um, maybe just invite you to uh, to monitor uh, what you see in the chat, and and in just uh, in just a few moments, um, share anything that's that's striking you, or um, that's showing up there, or anything that strikes you personally. Martin is writing, energizing. Hmm. That's the feeling I had actually. Um, some, not just the words on here, but the way you tell the story. Uh, uplifting the whole and its link to personal accountability strikes me as very powerful. So, yeah. And again, that those those words in the video you recorded for this session, uplifting the whole, that was they were the they were the very short words that made the whole video came came to life for me. And a lot of things that are coming in now. They're coming in quite high speed now, uh, different <laughs> ones. And, and uh, it, if I look at it, it's very much of this positive, on, uh, this focus on the positive, the possibility, uh, and that type of energy. And and um, um, and also a lot of uh, I would call it aspiration or appreciation for the principles that you are sharing. Love and it. I think there's a very deep principle here, which is from ego to eco. So uh, as again, action on the kind of the inner space from which we as individuals show up. Can we leave us for another 10 seconds and then allow the story to flow? Of course, you can all read what's coming in here. Wow. I just took the liberty of opening the chat. <laughs> Get really choked up. <laughs> you know, Phil, Phil I, I, I really, I, I mentioned her, but uh, you know, I, I really want to acknowledge Melanie, a uh, good child who, who has taught me so much in the last just four weeks. And the, the, the way it weaves with Annalise's experience in indigenous uh, mm -hmm. land in Australia, you know, it, it's, it was Melanie who spoke of uplifting the whole and, uh, and, and hearing the resonance of that with you and yeah. with others who are writing. I'm, I'm so grateful. 
I like this comment here from Vincent in, in Singapore, and that is that being human and uplifting the humanity. This is, these are principles about humanity and how we actually co-create or build upon and use the humanity perspective. Tor, just one, one quick comment on that. Um, what I love about the, uh, the Barrett Values hologram of, of whole systems change is at the outside of that is Earth and planet. And it's this reminder that humanity exists in the context of a much bigger system. And we need to take into consideration not just humans, but also animals, other sentient beings, the earth, the soil. Um, so this, this uplifting, uplifting all, uh, is, is, I, I appreciate that aspect of that, that holographic model. Thank you. Oh. We will publish all of these comments in the, um, in the document that we send out following this. So, you know, the quote that I'm reminded of when I see, every time I see that hologram model <laughs> is uh, shift the inside and the outside happens. I remember seeing that quote about 22 years ago in an article and that stayed with me too. <laughs> some great, Thank you so some much. great comments okay. coming through. It feels like a big love bomb. <laughs> <laughs> we we'll leave you now. Okay, we'll let you carry on. <laughs> So we want to we want to just go back to the story that Annalise began about uh, our meeting in in Cincinnati in two thousand and nine and and share another little piece of this this story uh, of the of the journey. Thank you. So so this it's so this brings us to the continuation of that story, Charles. And when we were both independently invited to present at the Barrett's conference in Toronto. So Mary Ann and I presented together and we finish our keynote on the evolution of her community. And then I see Charles literally, he's galloping down the centre of this big auditorium, legs and arms everywhere. And he was like this big, happy, lanky Labrador. <laughs> And you landed on the stage, you jumped up on the stage in front of us and you actually scared Mary Ann. <laughs> and, and I thought, is that Charles? Is that, the, is that the you crazy girl, Charles? And it was you. And, uh, and you jumped up on the stage and you said, you did it, you did it. And what you were referring to, Charles, was uh, the community work that we had talked about in Cincinnati. And so from there, our friendship re ignited <laughs> what, what was so extraordinary is um that uh that annalise and i said just as i was about to leave i had to leave early let's hold the intention that we had set in cincinnati uh, to find a way to work together we had no idea no idea what that would be and by the way it's true i did run down that aisle and <laughs> to the stage because the sense of the sense of pride and just the huge uh, admiration I had for, for Annalise following her, her purpose, following the, following the challenge that, uh, that Richard had put out there for her. But we set the intention, um, and I was just about to leave uh, and ran into another uh, keynote presenter at that same conference, uh, Jim. Staten and complimented him on his uh, on his presentation and how resonant it was for us and mentioned that I was going to be in Los Angeles uh, a couple months later and he arranged for us to meet and uh, we met and he said you know what I'd really like to have you and Annalise come and work with my finance team mm -hmm. um, talk about trust uh, and 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 a coincidence and it just it was extraordinary so from here on we're going to share with you uh, this extraordinary what's now three and a half year journey uh, with Jim his team uh, in the finance uh, in the finance group and Jim just again a big shout out to you for uh, inviting us into this yeah, ab ab absolutely. And so we we literally, we took all of those learnings over the last couple of decades, learnings from mentors, from our families, from our children, experiences that we've had. And we pretty much threw it all, everything that we knew into the finance experience. 
So we're going to share with you a strategic framework uh, behind every great program. There is a strategic framework. And so this is one that Charles and I have continued to shape and evolve over the last uh, three years together. So when we think about alignment, think about that as everybody being on the same page. Think about that as everybody working towards the same vision, the same values and the North Star. But alignment is short-lived if we don't engage the hearts and minds of the masses. So this is where people experience that emotional turbocharger, that sense of ownership and purpose that connects them to the culture journey. And from there we move to enable and this is really where rubber hits the road. This is where it's not just about values on posters on the wall, but we get really, really clear as Charles said earlier about what are the systems and the processes that uplift the whole. What is it that support us and what is it that hinder us? And finally, measurement. How do we know that we've been successful? And then the cycle, of course, it starts all over again. We, um, you know, we think of this as a, as, as a structure or a form. And as with, with most structures or forms, it could be formulaic uh, if you simply follow the, 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 the pieces. What I think has been probably one of the greatest learnings for me in this journey uh, in working with Annalise is the ongoing learning and experimenting with how we bring the four guiding principles that we've spoken of into each of these components. So, you know, we think of it as the, as the form or structure and then the spirit or, or way of being. And it's the combination of those. And we think of it in terms of that balance of how are we bringing our heads and our hearts into all that we do. So what we'd like to do is, is just share some, some examples of how we've done that at, at each stage, how we did that with uh, beginning with Jim's uh, senior leadership team. And we'll, we'll go, go through that very quickly, talk a little bit about, uh, about some of our key learnings as well as some of the outcomes. So in the align uh, phase, the very first thing uh, that Jim invited us to do was to conduct a leadership retreat uh, with his senior leadership team. Um, and Jim, again, a call out to you, your level of trust in us uh, to do what some would say were some, some crazy things, getting people to create paintings, getting people to, to draw. The picture that you see here right now uh, is one that, a moment that touched me more than anything else, which was towards the end of the two days, we asked people to write down the gifts that they saw in each other and to share those gifts uh, or strengths with each member of the team. Here you can see the uh, the team proudly presenting some of the work they did that reflected um, what was important to them. The level of vulnerability, the level of trust was was really extraordinary. We didn't do a uh, anything with the um, with the assessment with the with the leadership values assessment or the CVA in that first retreat. But following that. Jim asked and suggested that we do a senior leadership team values assessment. And for those of you familiar with um, the values assessment, you can look at the dot plot. And on this, you can see that certainly this team was ready, ready for a conversation that would take them to, uh, to a much deeper and, and powerful place as a team. We did that. Um, and following the introduction to the, the Barrett values work through the, the SLTVA survey, the invitation was made by Jim to his divisions, of which there are three uh, in the finance department, to conduct a CVA. And we did CVAs for each of the, uh, the three divisions, which was the, uh, was the stimulus to then to continue uh, through the cycle of, of this work. Thank you, Charles. So the engage part of this framework is my absolute favourite. So this, in this part of the framework, people get connected to the work and we run value summits where people share their experience of values through story. We run town halls where audiences create symbols and brands of the values journey. And uh, Charles, if you can just go forward one. Thank you. And, and of course, the Champion Network. Um, that program, it's essential in creating 
ownership of that internal community. And this is where we go deeper into personal mastery and how to continue to own and take the work forward. And personally, I have found many new brothers and sisters through the Champion Network, people that I believe I will know forever. I've never walked th through the halls of an organization or across the, uh, the campus of an institution and seen so many people leap up to give Annalise hugs. It's, it's extraordinary, this network of, of, of people uh, who have been touched by this. Um, certainly um, embedding uh, or enabling uh, and embedding this, the, the, the values in particular into the systems, processes, and, and structures has been, been key. Um, the values that were identified have been uh, included in uh, job descriptions, uh, systems and processes that enable or prevent the living of the values were identified. One of the most exciting things uh, that we found within the finance division was this commitment to actually identifying a position, uh, a culture engagement and communication uh, position to spearhead and hold the, the, the culture journey which was truly a, a form of enabling. The champions that Annalise mentioned, the, uh, the culture champions, worked with us to create a, a values in action a leader guide, and then they took, they took responsibility for rolling this out, introducing it to others uh, throughout, the, uh, throughout the finance division. Finally, um, of course, measurement matters. So feedback loops, accountability metrics, another value survey to see how we've shifted, whether our spouse values are actually part of our current culture. And, uh, and we look to see what the shifts in the current culture are. And, and typically we recommend those within 12 to 18 months. So we've just, you know, we've walked through the, the framework and some examples, all of it, as mentioned, guided by the principles. Another piece we wanted to, to leave you with that has been absolutely central to the way that we've been working together uh, is, is the importance of preparation uh, and ceremony. So we're just going to say a few words about, about each of these. Um, one piece of preparation that is consistent through all of what we've been doing in our work together is to invite individuals to complete their personal values assessment. It has been just so instrumental in setting up the different kinds of conversations and exploring questions uh, that, that connect people. So we are meticulous about setting up a room from inspirational messages, personal quotes, music, windows, nature, sitting. Our intent when people walk in is that we have poured all of our love and intention into every single detail. And that could take us, that could mean that we're there a couple of days before. And of course, round tables. These are relatively easy to find in corporate, but we do get a lot of pushback. And I've had many say to me, we have trestle tables and they'll do. And our answer is always, no, it won't do. The rectangular, the rectangle or the trestle table is a symbol of instruction and the circle is a symbol of unity and equality that Charles and I do and, uh, and rituals that we use in our practice. So the theme is uh, almost always um, focused on four things, on celebration, on uplifting the whole, the individual gift that each person brings to the community and knowing. I'm glad you're back. Just just a quick uh, quick build on on what Annalise was sharing. You'll see here uh, one of the uh, the centerpieces in a in a room that uh, that we ran a session in, and the white books around the outside of the circle. It's a, a book called Return on Integrity (ROI) that uh, that Jim had shared with his direct reports, and I'll never forget and want to share this quote from it, which I think is so beautiful. What's more important, being right or the relationship? So, um, of course, preparation um, of ourselves uh, is a part of, of, of this. Um, Annalise and I, before any engagement we have, sit down and, and share with each other what is the intention uh, that we're holding and what is the support or help that we both or each need in order to show up as our, our full selves. 
um, the evolution of our, our partnership and support for each other uh, over these last three years um, has been extraordinary. It hasn't always been easy. Um, I learned about mansplaining uh, for the first time uh, about two and a half years ago. Um, and I have been hyper conscious of it ever since. It uh, doesn't mean I always get it right, but uh, I've just, Annalise, thank you for the learnings uh, and for the, the preparation for so many aspects of my life through the work we've been doing. Thank, thank you, Charles, and all of that beautifully said. I think, I think what our clients can always say about us is that we are genuine and we're real. And of you, Charles, I'd like to say that you are the poet and the philosopher <laughs> and that you always have my back. And uh, when you get on the stage, you give 150% of yourself to that audience. So kudos to you, my friend. <laughs> Thanks. Annalise, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to jump to the success factors and, and maybe you invite you. I'm just conscious of our time. Um, so skip over to, to that and our learnings. Yeah, yeah. Look, I think what I really would like to say about the success factors is that the success of this program is widely attributed to leadership. And this is where I'd really like to, well, we'd, we'd really like to acknowledge uh, Jim's leadership here at so many levels. You know, Charles and I were really quite ambitious about doing a lot of work in really quick succession. And there were many moments when Jim put the brakes on and said no. And we didn't always understand why. Uh, but essentially what Jim was saying to us is, let this grow organically, go where the energy is, hold this vessel and give people space and time to step up as they're ready and with full ownership. And Charles, I really think it was a really important reminder to us to do our best work and be prepared for the shifts and trust the process. And we honour Jim for his insight, his patience, and his continual reminders to us to really trust that path. Yeah. You know, and as, as, as a result, um, and I'm just going to go over this slide very, very quickly, some of the impacts over the, the, the three and a half years you can see here uh, in terms of the three different departments within, within finance, um, the, the, the change that occurred. And I so echo, and at least what you've just said about the, the value of the organic evolving process versus a, a formulaic or structured one. We gained some pretty significant uh, learnings through this and, uh, and we'll touch on these just very briefly. Is that you, Charles? <laughs> Am I doing that one? I thought you were doing that one. I was <laughs> Well, we've touched on the organic growth of the process and the importance of going where, where the energy is. And, and, you know, we focus a lot on this space of vulnerability, even when it's not comfortable for us to do so. And we, we share our stories and we're in, we invite our audience to do the same. You know, we've talked about the champions and the importance of having an internal champion group who have taken the lead. Our goal is to ensure that Whoever we work with is capable of continuing that, this without us. So we've been touched by so many things. And, and Jim, the values moments that you started with your team uh, as part of this work, oh my goodness, could share so many stories about that. And, and I think what, you know, coming back to what challenged us, you know, we really pushed ourselves to learn and grow. And, and Charles and I, you know, we really are eternal learners. And it wasn't always easy to look in the mirror. And certainly when COVID happened, I had many, many amygdala hijacks. <laughs> and I buried my head in my hand and I said, how are we going to do transformation work online? How are we going to hold an audience? How are we going to engage? with our audience and uh, you know we are huggers and so we feel the isolation and we also feel the love and the connection that um, it's 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 a reciprocal energy we've learned that we can deliver that focus online so again thank you that partnership has been so important <laughs> i couldn't have done it without you <laughs> annalise has even learned how to break people into small groups on zoom 
I know, I know. <laughs> and finally, the metaphor that Charles and I love is the ripple effect. And uh, in particular, this worked really well in Aboriginal communities. And they made up this mantra, drop the rock and be the ripple effect. And, be, and we actually had these um, badges made. And Charles, if you can go to the next, um, to the next slide, hundreds of these badges were, were made. And we noticed then that people across the community were starting to wear these badges <laughs> and it was like a, a symbol of our unity together be the ripple effect and drop the rock it actually has energy and uh and and then we noticed that large groups were wearing the same badge so it was it, it, it's these moments of celebration that stay with us we've seen similar moments of celebration and and commitment to this ripple effect uh, in this journey uh, with USC. And I think we'll, we'll just close here with, uh, with a quote from one of, uh, one of Jim's uh, leads. And, and it's great, by the way, I noticed that Eric Brink and Rob Johnson are in this, this picture are on this webinar with us. Uh, just having the words on the wall is not enough. It's not just words for us. We really wanted to operationalize to truly live our values. And uh, it's been an honor uh, to see how the finance division at USC and now the ripple of that out to the broader university uh, has been occurring, uh, to see the, the, import, the recognition of values and the, uh, the living of them uh, in, an, in an institution of higher education is, is truly an inspiration. So Jim, uh, thank you for the invitation to be there. Richard, thank you for your work and having brought Annalise and I together. We're going to close there and uh, open this up in the brief time that we have uh, remaining to uh, some Q&A. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm actually, I'm actually going to start with a question for Jim to bring you in. Just uh, before you do that, Phil, uh, oh, we, yeah. we also didn't want to stop uh, that beautiful energy and sharing that you had. So we are going to run, we are aiming to run five minutes past hour. So uh, to give some more room for a question. Uh, it hasn't been that many questions to start with, but now at the end, it started to come in. So we have quite a few. So Phil. And, and if, anybody, start... if anybody needs to go on the hour, then please leave because this is being recorded. So you'll be able to watch the Q&A afterwards. So. I'm going to start with a question from Carol, uh, and it's for you, Jim. She, she'd love to know what was the challenge that, that you wanted to solve that, that started this? Why, why did you really bring Annalise and Charles in at the beginning? Um, yeah, great question. Thank you, Phil, um, Carol. Uh, the thing I was trying to solve for was an organization and teams that were very siloed. The three divisions that Charles mentioned were the Information Technology Division, the, the construction and maintenance uh, team, and then the finance team. And they all pretty much operated in, in silos in their other worlds inside of a bigger ecosystem. So I, I was looking for a way to, to bring these teams together and to drive uh, purpose. Uh, you know, Phil, when I met you in Sweden, uh, you, you invited me to Sweden. I was ready to come to that conference. I, I, I was so disappointed that I didn't make it, but when I saw Annalise's video after uh, the fact, I was for sure one of the main reasons that I made it to Toronto, um, where I met uh, Charles and then uh, actually went to Annalise's Stone Soup. And so it just all came together. And um, that was the reason I was, uh, thought that they might come to USC and California. Thank you. And this is a question for all of you. I think uh, it's from uh, Anna Stenbom and it's interesting to hear all these level of details that you define. Uh, uh, how much was actually designed up front and how much actually emerged during the process? Yeah, you know, I think that's a really awesome question to ask because, you know, Charles and I had milestones in mind, but this is where the beauty of this work really plays a part. As Charles and I continued to learn and expand our thinking, our program also continued to expand and evolve. And so you can try and start with a master plan, but it never ends with that master plan. <laughs> and so this is a shaping piece of, um, of, of work, but certainly some key milestones that we used as a guide only. And, and I just build on that and say that it was a delightful co-creative process in that 
Annalise and I, yes, had some of those milestones. We also had some ideas. For example, we thought we should do a values assessment before that first leadership retreat, but because it was co-designed with Jim, Jim's comment was, look, what I'd really like to do in that first session is, is build connection and trust. Then let's move it. So it was truly a co-creative collaborative process. Thank you. I have a question, actually two questions here, one from Daniel and one from Nina about values moments. What is a values moment? And curious about the values moments. Could we have an example of what this is and how it's implemented? Yeah, sure. I'll take that one. Um, values moments to me is stories. And before every meeting uh, that I have with my leadership team and Eric and Rob who are on the, the webinar here can testify to this, the first agenda item is who wants to share a Trojan value story. Um, and those stories uh, are, the space is open for people to come on and share uh, an experience ar around one of the core values um, that have been identified through this process. Thank you. Um, another question here from uh, Inge, and that is more of the, regarding the internal champions that you talked about, that community. Uh, but what in what time is in the process would you start involving them, so to speak? We we engaged in that very early. Actually, uh, we mentioned the summits and the town halls, and at both summits and town halls, we invited people to auto select themselves and so we had a lot of people coming through the pipeline saying that they wanted to be champions at a certain point in finance we had close to maybe 90 champions at one point across all of those departments uh, so again that also was an evolving process and it continued to refine as people continued to move through the champion development program one of the highlights was, for me was watching those champions host town halls and to stand up on the stage and say why the values work is important to them and share a story uh, about this work and its impact on them and to then hold the space for 200 people that is extraordinary. Yeah, so these divisions have 1400 people in total so these champions self-selected themselves because they were touched by this work and when they get on stage and talk from the heart, um, something they're not usually doing. Um, it changes the energy in, in the room for, for the masses. I can feel a values moment coming on. I have a question. <laughs> uh, Tash has asked, what's Jim's story? What's his personal purpose and driver? What's the backstory for Jim? Uh, um, it's this work. It's uh, you know. It's the the purpose for me, for me is just including in, in continuing to improve the health and well being and uh, uh, the nurture and healing of ourselves, um, uh, this planet, and uh, the people that are around us and business in our lives. So thank you for that question. There is a question here from Vincent, uh, which is more about uh, the leaders who are not aligned or committed. How did how how were they treated? How do you actually deal with those? Or maybe there yeah. were no. <laughs> uh, yeah, there are always there are always those. So, you know, I mean, listen, you know, what happened in the finance division was that the organization, you know, that has, you know, the thirty thousand employees, faculty, uh, students, seventy five thousand. Um, students, faculty, and staff in this organization, they started to notice the finance people, the, the changes um, that they, they saw. So we became, a lot of our champions and leaders became sort of guiding lights to an organization that has had its share of scandals and challenges and continues to. Um, and so, um, you know, I think it's just by example uh, that uh, some of the leaders who, uh, and, and at, through time, changes in leadership have occurred and there's been more that patience that Annalise and Charles talked about I think has paid dividends as new folks have come in and opened up space for that um, for this work to grow in bigger ways beyond the finance division. Thank you. I have a question here from Damesh um, <clears throat> pointed at Charles but anybody can answer this. I'd like to understand more about the distinctions between belonging and connectedness in the principles. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
so it's it's a great question and and i i think we could have spent a bit more time on on that earlier certainly and so thanks for asking it dermish i mean belonging uh in our experience comes is is a sense of it comes annalise touched on this is a sense of ownership i i belong to something that i have a role in creating i can feel connected uh to another uh, and feel this connection through through understanding, but not necessarily feel like I own uh, or have chosen to be accountable for what I belong to co-creating. Annalise, do you want to say anything to that? Uh, exactly, exactly that. And the and the other distinction around connectedness, as Elder um, Des said, is when I hurt, you hurt. And so my success is your success, my failure is your failure. So when we are uplifting the whole, there cannot be a mindset about them and us. So again, that, it, it is quite a distinction between that and the sense of belonging and ownership. I, I, just, I, I just want to add one thing on top of that. Phil and, and Torn Jim, as you know, the Dalai Lama event that I mentioned earlier was called Connecting for Change. And what we actually did was brought together executive leaders and NGO leaders, uh, people who would likely never otherwise meet. And the intent was to connect people who wouldn't otherwise meet to discover the possibilities they might not ever otherwise discover if they weren't connected. And the way we connected them was to ask the question, what is the help you most need to advance the work that you're most passionate about? Mm -hmm. And by having that conversation, they discovered connection in the form of a shared care for humanity and making a difference. And in many instances to the ripple effect, they, many of those people, those pairs went on to create something together that built their sense of belonging to a shared project. We are uh, coming to uh, close, even if I would love to continue this, but um, I have one more kind of last question. I don't know if that's the best one to end with, but what was the most difficult moment for you in the process? It was, you know, I mentioned the learning about mansplaining. Um, I, I had some, I had some learning to do about, and, and this is feeling kind of strange. I don't want to end on this. Um, having the last <laughs> word, um, I want you know, I want you to make sure Annalise has the last. Um, and Annalise gave me some feedback, and uh, it was, it was really difficult, and uh, to, to hear how my actions impacted her. Uh, in the context of, of a workshop that we were running. And I will never forget, she and I will never forget, because we've spoken about this many times, uh, a special cafe on the beach where we sat for hours and peeled back the onion of what was going on for each of us mm. um, and the trust that was built. Yeah. yeah, I'll leave you with that. Now, I think I'm going to change the question to Jim and say, what was the highest, the, big, the biggest most positive moment that you would say? Uh, you you know, yeah, it was at, it, and it was recent. It, it, when um, Annalise and Charles came back after the second time that the survey was taken and to see the results that Annalise showed, um, the changes in 18 months that people had, that people made, that, that those changes where values um, were more aligned uh, in these divisions and the entropy levels dropped, uh, you can't you can't fool that that and the questions we got that was great because the organization then sort of turned inward and said how did this happen how did you make this happen and that was the greatest thing because it created the possibility for this work to grow in bigger ways and touch more people in the organization I think that is a very good way to end uh, this thank you all of you for your I mean your genuine true honest straightforward uh, personal presentation and for being here and, and sharing this story and, and I think that it's good for people who are listening to this as well this this story is also written down in the case study so that you can read it with, and this recording will be sent out uh, afterwards um, uh, anything else that you would like to uh, add Phil uh, so that we have a good ending that I missed wow. anything? Yeah, there was so many moments during this session that I've been writing down <clears throat> questions and comments and observations from this to help me with my own challenges at this moment because it was it just resonated so deeply with me. So, yeah, thank you so much for, for Annalise and Charles and Jim for joining us at, at 
strange times of the day and uh, being so kind for us. Thank you very much to all of you and thank you for everyone who came. Yeah, thank you everyone. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay.